morning, everybody. I'm uh, shocked to see so many of you here. It's the last day. It's 9 a.m. What are you doing here? <laughs> so you're here for, yeah, okay, you're here. Thanks, Paul. <laughs> Kiss ass. <laughs> So uh, Zen Framework 3, this has been a long road. Um, believe it or not, 10 years of Zen Framework. Who was at the very first ZenCon? Well, we have a few people from the very first ZenCon. That is awesome. Uh, that was when Zen Framework was announced. It was announced as part of this huge community initiative that included uh, Eclipse, it included DevZone, it included Zen Framework. And so we have been working on it that long. Uh, I have been working on it almost that long, which is crazy. <laughs> that original architecture has actually stood the test of time. I've talked to a lot of people here this week who are still using Zen Framework 1 in production to this day. Uh, I tell them to move, but you know, hey, <laughs> they do this. It was component-based, and this is one of the things that was rather interesting at the time. Uh, back then, what other major libraries were out there for components? Anybody? Come on, Paul, you know. <laughs> no, 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 before, before that even. <laughs> yeah, yes, pair. okay. So there weren't many component libraries out there, and actually the barrier to entry was actually really high. Pair had this governance model, and everything had to get voted in, and so people just didn't want to do it. They finally opened up the pair channels. Libraries like Paul Solar came around. I had one called Fly. Uh, so they were starting to come around, but this was a huge deal when Zen Framework came out because we were providing this library of high quality components that were bound, to big to, bound together by an MVC. The MVC was just part of this. It bound everything together, it worked nicely, but you could use everything individually. Uh, that said, it was in one big SVN repository and if you wanted to use one component, you had to install the entire framework and that's the way it still is today. It evolved a lot over the years. Uh, I came on, let's see, I came on f in 2007 uh, full time. Uh, I had helped spearhead the MVC rewrite for version one the year before. We had a very nice version one, but over time it evolved into the really nice framework that it became. Uh, we added first forms, uh, and that was one of the first major form libraries that uh, actually worked well and had things like translation uh, built into it, which was uh, a novel concept at the time. We eventually added layouts, because uh, everybody wanted to do that. Magento had been bugging us forever, and then they didn't use it, which bothered me. But we finally got to an even better architecture when we introduced Zend Application, and I think that was around 1.8 or 1.9. It took us quite a while to get to there. And once we got there, we had the modern Zen Framework 1 stack. It's what everybody knows about. It's what's in all of the uh, various books out there, all the trainings that you see, all have Zend application built into there. And eventually we started branching out and trying to make your lives even easier. We had Dojo, we had jQuery integration, and we built that in so that you could have nice looking forms that did validations, uh, nice looking pages that were interactive and could interact with your PHP code on the back end. It's really cool stuff. Made a very useful stack. But then, of course, everything must change, and so we had a bit of a revolution. We discovered that while it was a nice stack, there were a whole, whole bunch of bugs and problems that were there in large part because of the architecture. Because it was component-based first, and then we tacked on the application stuff later and the form stuff later, there were a lot of integration points that didn't work as well as they could and actually bogged things down for you as developers. So Zen Framework 2 was really a rethinking of the framework entirely. We went to an event-driven architecture. So we have this event manager, and the event-driven architecture allowed us to create custom workflows. And we could say, let's bootstrap. OK, now let's route. OK, let's dispatch. OK, now that we're done with that, let's go and render the view, and now let's send the response. But it also allowed you, as developers, to go in and write your own events. We made use of this in App Agility itself. Authentication and authorization are events. So we can trigger these events and you guys can go and wire into them and do your own authentication or your own authorization if you want to. It's a really nice system. It gives a uniform way of plugging into the workflow. 
and it's not something that requires us to add new like pre-dispatch, post-dispatch, pre-pre-dispatch hooks, you know, that sort of thing. You just go in and do these events and you wire into that. The other thing that we learned with send application is that dependency injection is a good thing. Why? It helps you decouple your code from the dependencies so you're typing on things like interfaces so that things are replaceable. It also makes testing a whole lot easier because now you don't have to set up a container and try and remember what all different services might need to be in there. You mock the specific dependencies and you can start testing, which made testing your controllers a lot easier. So these are really cool concepts. And they enabled another thing, which was first class modules. We tried to do a module system in Zen Framework 1 and it never really worked. It never took off. It was too bulky, too hard because everything had been tacked on gradually onto this MVC system on top of components. By rethinking and re-architecting, we were able to do something that we'd never been able to do before, which is create a module system. And the module systems essentially just give you services to inject and wire those services into the workflow. It's a really powerful paradigm, but it also comes at a cost. It was a complete break in compatibility. How many of you successfully migrated from Zen Framework 1 to 2? Yeah, it's okay, you had a few of you. How many of you found that relatively easy and got it done in a, a couple of weeks? Okay, one, two, okay. You guys are also senior developers, so I'm, you don't count. <laughs> this is the thing. It targeted senior developers. Zen Framework 2 is a really powerful, powerful architecture and it gives you a lot of flexibility. I know a few people in here who are good friends who absolutely love it, but they are able to look at it and understand how it works because they have years of experience. For those people coming into frameworks for the first time, Zen Framework 2 is incredibly daunting, which means we don't get as many people coming in, which means we start losing relevance, right? And this was in large part because we now have components that depend on integration. If you want to use forms, I was just talking to somebody down here earlier, they want to use forms, you are depending on how everything is wired together versus knowing how to you know, use the individual component by itself. And if you know how to use the individual component by itself, that doesn't necessarily translate to how the MVC helps you wire it together. So we broke things. We broke things in wonderful ways, which is great, but it was a problem. So over time, the ecosystem changes. Andy talked a lot about a lot of these ecosystem changes on Tuesday during the keynote. The first one is Composer. How many of you are not using Composer? Okay, I have a few hands here. Those of you who are not using Composer, go to getcomposer.org and start familiarizing yourself with it because this is how applications are developed today. Composer does two things for you. It gives you dependency management so I can install anything and if it has dependencies, it makes sure that those are resolved for me and tells me if they can't be. And it also gives me auto-loading. So a lot of the commodity stuff that I used to have to do by hand through SVN externals or downloading packages and keeping track of feeds to see when uh, new releases came out, I don't have to worry about it anymore. I just run Composer Update every now and then and everything's great. The other thing that came about was Framework Interop Group. That's weird. I thought I had another thing under there. Framework Interop Group. Group of frameworks came together in 2009 at uh, PHP Tech. I had to think about that for a second, which year it was. Uh, PHP Tech, and what we did at that point was we said, hey, you know, people are wanting to use code from you in my project and code from my project in yours, and they can't easily right now. So how can we make this happen? And we started proposing PHP standards recommendations. And from these, we were able to start sharing things. It's actually how Composer came to be. Composer was able to do auto-loading because we had a specification, PSR0, that defined how auto-loading can happen. And any project that uses PSR0 was automatically able to ship a package with one line of configuration and your classes are completely exposed to the user. It's awesome. So FIG came around, it's starting to propose standards. 
and it's proposing not just standards like coding standards, but also shared interfaces, which allow you to start decoupling. And I'm going to go into that in a lot more detail in a few minutes. But one of those is PSR 7. The problem that came up is that every single framework, every single client library is abstracting HTTP differently. So if I want to use Buzz instead of Guzzle, or if I want to use Stack PHP instead of Zen Framework, I not only have to take my code and change the controller, I have to change the controller, I have to change what request and response paradigm I'm doing, I have to learn how each of those works, and it's basically an entire rewrite of my whole stack right there. So a group of us said, hey, let's standardize that. That should be a commodity. When we look at the ecosystem like this, we realize that frameworks kind of have to change. Because we're now looking at a world where anybody can install any package at any time very easily with a minimum of dependencies. They don't want to grab your entire framework for one component. So you need to be able to get that one component. And those need to be replaceable. So the job of a framework is going to be to provide plumbing for you. That's it. And then it has to get out of your way. Let you do what you do best. So we came up with a list of goals for Zen Framework 3. First one is componentization and reuse. Now, we were already shipping the components separately. I'll tell you a bit about that. But we weren't doing it well. <laughs> so we wanted to make it work reliably, and we wanted to make it uh, really target reuse of these components at a very small level. Performance was one of those. Now, the interesting thing about Zen Framework 2 is we did a bunch of benchmarks with that and other uh, application frameworks. And what we saw is that as you add more functionality to an application, with most frameworks, that either is a steady increase in the amount of time it takes to respond to request, the amount of resources it's using, etc. Sometimes it's even exponentially more. With Zen Framework 2, is actually kind of parabolic. You get past a certain number of modules and it just pretty much stays the same. So we actually had really good performance for complex applications. But that hello world was really, really slow. And we knew it, and we were trying to figure out how to optimize it, and we realized that we were going to have to break some things in order to make it faster. Another thing was usability. Our documentation sucks. I'll just go out and say it. Our documentation sucks. We have a lot of documentation, a lot of documentation, but the problem is that it doesn't necessarily address a lot of use cases. And another part of it is that it's not a documentation-driven framework right now. And so as a result, we have a lot of weird code out there that if you start documenting, you're going, why are we doing that? So we want to start focusing on usability and documentation. And part of that is trying to document as we go and making changes to the code to make it easier to work. We also want to focus on PSR7 and middleware. We want to make ourselves replaceable. We also want to make it easy for people to start using us. And the only way to do that is to get out of the way. Now, back in March, I gave a version of this talk, and I talked about all these things that we were going to do. It's great because now here it is October, and I can talk about what we have done. And that's really fun. We haven't been entirely open about it because we've been so hedged down trying to get the work done that we haven't been telling you what we've done. So we're going to do that today. The first thing is components. Every single component now lives in its own repository and it's versioned separately. It's not a monolithic repository anymore. We split it out. Now, you may be asking, why would we do that? There's a few good reasons here. One is it helps us then identify what dependencies each one has and are they absolutely necessary. The old adage of don't repeat yourself is not always a great thing. The dry principle is great in many ways, but when it comes to dependencies, sometimes it makes sense to keep the logic in the context where it's being used. So we're going to try and do that. By doing things separately, though, we've also been able to make incremental changes and push components forward in ways that we couldn't before. In the past, 
we have components that were getting a new version every single time, even though no changes have happened because they're perfectly stable, which is ridiculous. Why would I, am I bumping up to 2.2 or 2.3 when nothing changed? But on the flip side of the coin, we had components where we were holding back features for months or years simply because they were going too fast. They couldn't go at the same pace as the uh, framework, so we hold them back. So that changed. Uh, Alexi, are you here? Yes, you are. So this was great. I talked about the standards. PSR3 is a logging standard. And uh, it came about, actually, was it like two years ago, three years ago? It was uh, one of the fastest ones to go through the system. And uh, because it's very simple. We haven't been compatible with it because it was going to require some changes and, uh, you know, we couldn't go at the same pace. Once we broke off the components, I think it was about a month after that, we were able to release a new version. Alexi went and said, hey, let's make this PSR3 compatible and we'll also make it possible to drop in PSR3 log writers. And we were able to do a new minor version of that without waiting for the rest of the framework, which was awesome. We're able to do that sort of thing. So the components that need to evolve faster can do that now, and you can get those updates sooner. You don't have to wait for a full framework release where we get you know, 10, 20 different features. You can go and do a composer update, and now all of a sudden Zenlog goes up to 2.6, and now you have PSR3 compatibility. Fantastic. It took a lot of work to get here, <laughs> and uh, I have this link to the full story. The ZF2 split was uh, excruciating, mind-numbing, uh, and crazy, but it, in the end, we actually have the full history of every package in there. They're all uniformly create, um, uh, versioned. They're all uniformly uh, uh, structured. So they ha you look at any one of them, they look the same, which is great. And that structure, we do things like modernize them. We brought them up to PSR4, which is a auto-loading standard replacing PSR0. Gave us a shallower structure, makes it easier to find the code. And we did that for the, uh, the tests and the source. We're doing documentation per package, which allows us to do something we couldn't do in Zen Framework 2, which is say, I'm not going to let you, I'm not going to merge that feature unless you finish the docs first. And I can actually put a needs documentation on it. And somebody else, one of the other maintainers will say, oh yeah, there's no documentation in this commit. So I'm going to hold on it too. This is still in progress. Uh, Gary. Hawken is uh, doing the uh, spearheading the work on this. We are going to be doing some, uh, essentially he's got a script that's going to go through and convert our restructured text documentation to Markdown. Uh, it'll get us about 70 to 80% of the way there. And then he's going to go through and create issues saying, you know, we need to do, do this, this, and this to get it ready for uh, the final version. Those will have a documentation tag, a needs help tag, and we'll have a search for that. So you'll be able to go in and help us. Those will be very quick. We also have a standard QA tool chain for every single one of them and continuous integration for every single one of them. And it's great because now we can see if another package changes, whether it affects this one, and the very first time that we ran a test. Now we had continuous integration for the whole framework before, but this is faster because these tests run in a matter of a few seconds versus the minutes it would take to do the entire Zen Framework 2 suite before. So we get instantaneous feedback, which is fantastic. What that has meant for the Zen Framework 2 package is that starting with 2.5, it now simply depends on components. There is no code whatsoever in the Zen Framework repository now. None. All it is is a composer JSON that depends on every single different component we, uh, we ha ship at this point. This means something to you as a developer. It means that you can go and say, I'm on 2.5. I'm going to say composer update. Now I get Zend log 2.6. And I get Zend, standard, uh, Zend service manager 2.6. Zend standard lib 2.7. And it all still works together. But you get the update sooner. You don't have to wait for a framework release. You wait for the component releases and they come very quickly. This means that Zen Framework 3 gets to do something that we haven't been able to do before, is that we can get rid of components. And then we're not actually going to get rid of the components, but do you necessarily need Zend barcode in your Zen Framework 3 application? 
Most of you probably can say no. Are all of you using Zen Navigation? No. Are all of you using Zen Paginator? No. Some of you aren't even using ZenDB, you're using Doctrine, so why would you have the DB package? So we can slim down the framework itself to only what's absolutely necessary to ship the MVC, which is fantastic. At that point, you use Composer to add what you need. That puts you into control. You get to control your application cycle and your dependencies, which is exactly what we want you to do. That said, change is inevitable. Backwards compatibility breaks will happen, unfortunately. I mean, we focused our effort at this point on components, which is the first part, but then we identified some components that really needed to change. One of those is the service manager. Now, the basics of the service manager are staying exactly where they were. What happened there? That's weird. Is that up on the screen? There we go. Okay. So the first one is that we're using container interop. How many of you have heard of this? Okay, a hand, handful of you. Container interop is uh, they're basically a project that will eventually probably go to uh, the FIG. It's wanting to standardize how containers work. Now, the basics of a container are that it has a get and it has a has. That's all there is to it. We're actually now using that as our base interface for the service manager. And that started with 2.6 or 7, and whatever our latest release on the 2.x branch is for Zen service manager. So that's the first thing. That means that you'll type hints slightly differently in your factories if you're actually using those. Next bit is that we made the interfaces consistent. The signature for the method that actually builds an object, an abstract factory, it was different than the one in factory interface, which was different than the one in the initializer interface, which was different than the one in delegator interface, which is crazy. So we wanted to make all of those consistent. So uh, we, most of this work actually came from a community member, uh, Mikael Galejo, Bakura on uh, IRC. He went and said, okay, let's make all these consistent. One thing he did, they're all invoke, which means any PHP callable will work. And that's important. Keep Keep a note on that because we're going to talk about that in a moment. But it meant that, first off, any callable, then the first argument is always the container. So you know that the container is the first argument and then any additional arguments come after that, which is great. You can now reuse factories for multiple named services. Actually, this exists now in Zen Framework 2, but we never documented it. <laughs> it's documented now. You can reuse factories for multiple named services, and this is the big break in the factory interface. It means that you don't necessarily need to use an abstract factory anymore. You can point a service name at a factory and it will get that name and it can actually branch and create a different instance based on that. The big thing though is that it's immutable. We used to allow you to add services ad hoc in your application. That caused our performance problem because we had to keep track of state. What factories are in there? What new services have been cached? What hasn't? Does caching change how things work, et cetera? By making it immutable, we can actually do a whole lot of optimizations up front as soon as it's configured, which gives us a huge performance boost. And when I say huge, four times faster for the worst case scenario. We're seeing sometimes 15 to 20 times faster for some of the simpler cases. That's a huge difference for you because you're quite often using hundreds of different objects within your particular request. And as I said, it's mostly backwards compatible. Now we do have one new method and it's build. If you've used a, uh, an app, uh, one of the plugin managers, this is a big deal because it separates it from the main service locator interface. And this is how we can do factories. And this is how we're thinking ahead to compatibility with other organizations. We didn't have to change the signature of the container interop. We just add another method and we now can still work with everybody. Options allows us to do conditional stuff. The big break though is factory interface. So if you're implementing factory interface, uh, we now have an extra required argument and an optional argument. That said, you can make your code forward compatible really easily by just making your factories all invocables and either not type pending the first argument or type pending on container interface and now your code will just work. We did this already in AppAgility Anything, any factories created in AppAgility 
we're just doing invocables. We weren't even type pinning the first argument, which means that they are drop in. They just work with Service Manager 3, which is great. The other component that changed a lot is the event manager. Huge performance gains. Uh, again, Mikhail Galejo is one of the big uh, people working on this. The other one was uh, my own team member, uh, Enrico Zimuel. They looked at it and said, okay, how can we make this faster? And what they discovered, well, okay, first off, Mikhail went and broke everything to make it faster. <laughs> And I said, no, 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 we want to give a migration path. And so I gave them constraints. I said, try and keep it backwards compatible. And so the two of them started working and Enrico did one set of changes and then Mikael looked at those and said, hey, let's do even more. And it came back to components. We were using uh, essentially SPL priority queue, but in Zen standard lib, we had extended that in order to make it uh, serializable and make it possible to iterate through it multiple times. So we were depending on Zen standard lib. And Enrico went and said, okay, I think I can figure out a faster way of doing this than PHP even does. And he created one called, um, I think it was FastQ or something like that. And we started using that and that was in the uh, standard lib. And it was much, much faster. I mean, we, we had huge gains right off the bat. And then Mikael said, you know what? I know that that code is over there, but I think if we inline it directly in the class itself, so we're gonna repeat ourselves, we're gonna completely break the dry rule, but we're going to put it in the context where the actual code needs to live, I think we can do so, make it even faster. And so we did, and it was. So we went from two times faster to four times to up to 15 times faster on events. The worst case scenario is the one that you have in most Zend MVC applications where you have multiple shared listeners and multiple events uh, and multiple uh, uh, local listeners. That's the worst case scenario, four times faster. <laughs> I'll take it. But it did mean a few BC breaks. As we started going through and documenting those, I started documenting the actual component. And I was talking about usability earlier. As I documented, I was going, wow, this trigger method is crazy because we were overloading every single argument. How many of you have had to look up the definition for trigger a couple of times to figure out what was allowed? Yeah, a lot of you, right? You get used to it after a while, but it's not great. But that overloading added complexity to the code and it added performance. Uh, not added performance, it detracted from the performance. The other part that we noticed is that the aggregate attachment, we had multiple ways to do it. So we had to go and break a few things. So with triggering, we decided to focus on four discrete behaviors. One is just triggering a named event with a target and potentially arguments. Another was triggering until a callback told us we were done. Triggering an actual event instance and then triggering that event instance until a callback tells us we're done. So we made four discrete signatures. We tried to make them consistent between them. So for instance, with the until versions, we always put the callable first because that's the important context. And that keeps everything in the same order after that. By doing this, we also made, were able to make a forward compatibility story because 2.7 of Event Manager, we added those last three methods. So you have a migration path if you're triggering events now, rewrite your triggers to fit one of these four signatures and you're done, which is exactly what we did in the MVC, which means that the MVC will look basically the same and act basically the same. The other thing that we did was change the aggregates. Before there were three different ways to attach an ag aggregate. You could say events attach, you could use events attach aggregate, or you could use aggregate attach and pass it the events instance. We decided that, you know what, the event manager doesn't care if it's an aggregate or not because all it cares about are the listeners. So we're just doing one signature. This signature has always existed, which means you can make your code forwards compatible now just by using this signature instead of the other three, or other two rather. So we're thinking ahead. How do we make it simpler to use but also, now that we know the, how simpler it is to use, what can we do in the old version to make it easy for you to go forward? 
And that brings us to the MVC. So we've done a lot of work on the MVC. I was really hoping that we could have a release candidate for now, but uh, there's a lot of work. Uh, we've updated it to all the changes in the service manager. Um, that took way too long. <laughs> I thought it was going to take about a day. It took me over a week. Uh, and the reason is that the MVC is essentially just a collection of factories. <laughs> and they were all type hinting because we were trying to be good object-oriented citizens, and as a result, uh, it was really hard. We updated to the changes in the event manager. That took about two hours, which was awesome. My slides did not update. This is weird. It essentially stays the same. What's gonna be great about the, uh, when we actually do a release of Zen Framework 3, of the MVC 3, is that your applications will essentially just work. You don't have to make changes to your infrastructure. Your migration story is maybe a few changes to factories, maybe a few changes to triggering, and you're done. It will just work. And the best part is you're gonna have about a 4x faster application, which is exactly what you probably want right now, right? We did add one thing, and that's a new middleware listener. We wanted you to be able to start using PSR7, but we didn't want to re-architect because we saw what happened when we were architected before. So we said, okay, what if instead we modified our workflow, because we have this nice event-driven workflow, what if we were to modify that and add another listener into the dispatch area and allow you to dispatch PSR7 middleware? So we did a couple of things. We added this middleware listener that Instead of having a controller default, you have a middleware default. If it sees that when it routes, it'll say, okay, I'm gonna dispatch this as middleware. Then we created a PSR7 bridge that takes our Zend HTTP stuff, converts it to PSR7, and dispatches with those, gets back a response, converts back, we're done. It adds very little overhead, but it allows you to start converting your controllers into middleware, or consuming all the middleware that's starting to come around you can start consuming that directly. Now you won't necessarily have the same pipelines and everything that you have in things like Relay and Expressive, but you'll be able to take some of those nice widgets and everything, like perhaps a user widget of some sort, and drop it in, which is gonna be great. But enough with the boring stuff. That's really the old stuff, right? That's MVC, that looks like Zen Framework 2. Boring. That's not a good announcement, right? You don't want to hear that. Um, what it comes down to is that that's the MVC that we already know, only a, a little bit faster. And we thought to ourselves, what can we do to make this even better? Essentially, where is the PHP community headed? Now, I already answered these questions, but so let, let's look at it again now in the context of our MVC offering. So composers out there, everybody is going and grabbing the packages they need to build their applications. And Fig is saying, let's create shared interfaces so that users can target the abstractions and not the implementations, which means that somebody using a logger can just say, I'm going to target PSR3 and their interfaces, and I don't care what logger is actually used by the application consuming my code. PSR7 is saying, hey, I'm gonna type hint on these HTTP message interfaces, and I don't care how the application, what it uses, just how I can get that in, you know, I just wanna consume it once it gets here. If they're targeting abstractions and not implementations, then they're no longer as worried about a framework. They're also looking at things like middleware, right? Uh, how many were at the PSR7 talk I did earlier this week? So this is familiar to a lot of you. All this is is taking an incoming request and transforming it into a response. That's all there is to middleware. There's a few different ways of looking at middleware, and we're seeing a few of them shake out right now. Uh, there's three, maybe four signatures. These are the three most common I'm seeing. The first one is a literal translation of that previous slide, which is I get a server request interface and I return a response, great. 
The next one that we see quite often is I'm getting a request interface and a response interface, and then I return the response interface. Now this one is interesting because the first one, I'm required to rely on a concrete implementation of the response in order to return it. The second one, I get a response coming in, which means I've got a response prototype I can start using right off the bat, and I don't have to depend on a concrete version of that. That's pretty powerful because that means I can drop in my code and again, it doesn't matter what PSR7 implementation is around and I'm not introducing another concrete version that you now have to depend on in order to use my code. You just depend on the interfaces. The third one adds a third argument, callable next, because quite often I want to wrap other middleware so that I can do complex things. And the only way I can do that is somehow getting that other middleware into my application. How do I do that? The way that uh, Ruby's Rack did it, the way that Stack PHP does it, uh, the way that Slim used to do it is that you would inject it somehow into the object and then you can just call next, you know, call, call that object in order to execute the middleware. By passing the middleware in, however, I can just invoke it directly and I don't have to worry how to get it. It's not a convention-based approach, it's an explicit approach. So the way I like to think of these three is that we're going from depending on some concretions to depending on no concretions, to depending only on abstractions. And that's a very powerful power paradigm. So that's where the PHP community is also going. The next place that the community is going is even more of these shared interfaces. And one of these is container interop. I mentioned this before, this is the container interface, it's just has and get, very easy. When we start getting lots of these plumbing interfaces and abstractions out there, what's the point of a framework? So my takeaways from this are that really frameworks are an implementation detail and should be an implementation detail. In fact, quite often you're gonna be developing the framework from commodity components. So at that point, the framework is really just a commodity. I want to be able to swap it out at any point based on perceived value that the framework or the component gives me. The framework should get out of the way of your code. The framework really should be in the background so that you can focus on what you're trying to deliver. And that brought us to an idea. And we thought to ourselves, how could we embrace this fully? So we created Expressive. How many of you were at the opening keynote? That should be pretty much everybody. Not everybody though, okay. So Zev demonstrated this. It's a PSR7 middleware micro framework. It provides and consumes a routing interface. We actually don't have a routing implementation in Expressive itself. We have a couple of sub packages that do this, but we don't have our own implementation. We are pulling the matched middleware from routing from a container interface. We're not providing the container. You put the container in. If you need to do templating, we have an interface for that so that you can depend on the interface, but you can swap out the implementation. Maybe you like plates, maybe you want to use twig later, maybe you decide to go with mustache. You can swap it out, but it doesn't affect your middleware at all. And then we provide error handling and a way to hook into it so that you can drop in your own error handling. Essentially, all we're doing is providing a little small runtime that wires a few things together so that we get out of your way. And the way it works is I can go and install this using Composer. Composer create project, Zen framework, Zen expressive skeleton. And it goes and prompts me, what do you wanna use? Do you want to use the Aura router? Do you want to use Fast Route from Nikita Popov? Do you want to use the Zend router? What container do you want to use? Aura DI, Zen Service Manager, Pimple. What templating? Do you want to use Plates? Do you want to use Zend View? Do you want to use Twig? How do you want to do error handling? And it goes and it rewrites your Composer JSON and installs what you asked for. And if at any point in there you don't see something you want, but you know a package that implements that interface, 
you write it down in there and it will go and say, okay, I'll install that for you. We're using Composer to let you choose what you want to use to create your own framework. We're wiring together commodity components so that you can own your own code base. Because that's the future. That's actually the present for a lot of you, but it's the future for a lot of you, is that you are going to start using commodity components so that you can go and create exactly the application architecture you need to solve your business problem. So Zen Framework 3, it's not about the MVC. Everybody thinks that Zen Framework 3 is gonna happen when we release the MVC in a, a few weeks here. No, it's already happened. Zen Framework 3 is a movement. It's an end to framework silos. And that sounds strange coming from the guy who does Zen Framework, but this is the direction that everybody's going to be going soon, I guarantee you. And I think it's really, really exciting because it empowers you as a user. And that's really what I want to see. I want to see you able to create awesome applications every day and deliver business value to your company. And so we're gonna get out of your way and let you do that. Thanks for coming today. You can find me at framework.zen.com, appagility.org, mwop.net, or mwop on Twitter. Thanks for coming to ZenCon. I hope you had a great time, and I uh, hope you enjoy the last few talks here. Thanks. <laughs>